Ian, what was your first exposure to broadcasting? It wasn't the BBC, was it? I think it was actually ITN. Well, the first job I got was ITN. I tried to get into the BBC and got a final board at the graduate trainee scheme, um, but failed at the last hurdle. So I shrugged my shoulders and uh, went off and managed to get into ITN because fortuitously, it must be 1966, yeah. there was a general election and they needed well, someone to do the late night headlines. Uh, ITN had a three minute newscast at 11 o'clock, which give you up all, all the latest from the polling stations or whatever's going on during the lead up to the election. So they needed someone else. And it was Sheridan Morley son of Robert Morley, the actor, yeah. um, who used to do that, and he went across to the BBC. So uh, a gap opened, and it was quite fortuitous that as I'd done some news reading on the local station at Bristol, and Geoffrey Cox had twin, Sir Geoffrey Cox, the head of um, ITN, had um, twin daughters there, and when he at home was saying, we need someone to read three minutes worth of news at 11 o'clock, they said, well, there's this guy from university. So it's funny how you can be tracked down. And presume you got some sort of screen test. Yeah, they did indeed. Um, it's, I mean, it's quite easy to test someone reading the news because you just put up an, what was then a teleprompter. Yeah. And actually, a girl, now I come to think of it, a PA winding it for you. Um, and uh, Probably a paper one, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So that if she wanted to make changes, she could just use a, yeah. a thick pen. And that exposed you to other ITN presenters, presumably. Yes, I mean, it, well, the presenters wouldn't be on when I was on, but I'd meet them during the day. And because they paid me a full salary, albeit a low one, they didn't want me sitting around until 11 o'clock in the evening. And I got a job as a scriptwriter. That was infinitely more challenging because at that time, ITN was still black and white. And we would actually cut, or the film editors would cut the film in negative so as we could get it on air nice and quickly. And we had a, a machine, of which I do not know the name, that actually turned it from negative to positive. Um, but problems could arise when young people like me had to do the, I can remember the phrase that you were obliged to use almost, as, it's been a day of coming and going at Downing Street. And this particular day was the Commonwealth Prime Minister's conference. Most of them were black. So in the negative that I, that I had to cut, it was just little white blobs going into number 10. And not easy. No. Which year was this? 66. 66. Probably. How did you then move to the BBC? Well, persistence banging at the door of all the different departments. And the job came up in presentation, a department run by Rex Morford. And uh, I looked at the internal applications and thought, well, I'm, they won't mind that I'm not internal. And they didn't, because the job was what was then called, confusingly, a PA, uh, which is the BBC term for everything from director to assistant producer. Yeah. So you were interviewed at the usual place, Five Portland Place, were you? I was for the general traineeship. That was the uh, all the heads of department that were free that day that came along. But no, for this it was just done within presentation. So my interview, I think, was in Rex Warford's office. And this was presumably to work at Television Centre? Uh, very, very much Television Centre. Presentation was the beating heart uh, of the TV service because not only did they put on trailers, which was a large part of the people working there had to make, but also there were editors who were effectively running the service in the evening um, and deciding whether programmes could overrun or whether they'd shorten them and put some promotional material in and would refer up to the channel controller, who presumably was home in, for most of the evening, um, if, if a big decision was needed. I can remember, I never did that job, but standing in for an editor one evening, and I didn't know whether I could, I don't know, push something later or whatever, and I had to ring Alistair Milne, who was then the director of programmes at home, uh, for authority. It eludes me whether he gave it or not, or whether the uh, programme in question was that important. So you were in presentation, but as, as, a, as a PA, 
What were you expected to do? I think the presentation by then was divided into various bits, and the one that I was attached to was presentation programmes that, that arose out of linking material, and they included two points of view programmes, junior and the uh, regular points of view, which I see is still running on the Sunday, but done in a very different way now. But then it was very simple, and uh, they asked me to go and visit Robert Robinson to ask him if he'd uh, come and do it. This was junior points of view, for goodness sake, and I thought, a bit of an insult, because he'd been doing, he'd taken over from David Frost on the late night television. He did BBC Three on the Saturday night, which was a very witty and mature programme, and to ask him to deal with children's letters. He lived in a very nice house in Cheney Row, and I did as I was asked, and surprisingly he said yes. Gave me a large whiskey. I didn't realise that uh, junior, that points of view started off as junior points of view, so it then became points of view proper, did it? No, I think it's the other way round. I think points of view gave birth to junior points of view. Um, there was sufficient material and um, a useful programme because it could be of an indeterminate length, quite short, if, if you so wish. And um, you could squeeze it in somewhere where you needed to... So they were fillers, really, were they? Points of view programmes? I think they were. Sort of ten minutes or something? Yes. It, it had been going for long enough by the time I arrived for me not to know the purpose of the programme. Um, and uh, we would get criticised if we became too frivolous. So they would give an idea of public opinion. But, um, yeah, they were fillers. But he was an really extremely witty man. Yeah, and I continued to work with him on a series called The Fifties, we wanted to cut off Brian Inglis's All Our Yesterdays. So if we get on in the 50s, and Brian Inglis on ITV was coming up through 47, 48, we'd beaten him to it. Beaten him to it yeah. And Robert Robinson was a, a very well-read and a great wordsmith. And uh, we began in 1950. So he would write material for the 50s, would he? He would actually write scripts for it. He would write a script. I would provide him with a draft, which is very often the way, and used to be the way probably in television, saying what's in it, what comes next, and there's a picture of uh, some film of the Cambridge boat sinking in the boat race or whatever like that, and he would link it to the next piece of material. Yeah, and then you'd run the whole thing from Pres A or Pres B, running in bits of film, would you, and, and then edit the thing later or what? Yes, that's how it was done. I mean, there was some pride in getting it right first time because editing at that time was still quite a, a bit of a challenge because the sound used to run 28 frames, I think, ahead of the picture. That's yes, right, the L-shaped edit you had to do. Is that what it's it called? Is. Well, it was this two-inch tape. Yes, yeah, two-inch. Yeah, so you had, to, you had to cut it because you didn't do two machine editing. It was one machine. No, exactly. Yes, I know. And then, uh, yeah. And the young people today who are able to press over buttons to do an edit, I had to go back to that. Well, so he was, was he good at uh, one take? Robert, yes, he was. He was extraordinarily um, professional, is the word one would say. But yes, he knew how to sit in front of a television camera and address it. Now, was Will Wyatt working with you at that stage? Yeah, Will had joined the BBC and was working, I think, in Yorkshire, where he applied for a transfer, and they gave him an attachment to my little unit, and I was producer and he was assistant producer, and a very good one. So this was coming up to about 69, was it? Yeah, about that. Yeah. Now, BBC Two had been created, and there was a, an influx, of, a large influx of people uh, to that. I remember we made the first programme for BBC Two and it was called Colourful Two and we had the first controller, David Attenborough, on it and uh, Julian Pettifer, the foreign correspondent, you might say, or reporter. And I do remember that although we were in colour, David and Julian discussed the Arctic, which we see on television as largely white, but in fact it is full of colours. I haven't been, but uh, they rhapsodised about it. Oh, so you met Attenborough as a, as a performer? Well, he had been made controller of BBC Two, so he was going to run it. And in the run-up to it being officially unveiled, Late Night Lineup would sometimes have a little colour in it. And Rowan Ayers, who ran Late Night Lineup, liked the idea of having you wear a dark suit, 
but just a coloured tie and you know you just introduce it simply and I think that would have been on both channels that Wimbledon ran in colour in the first year and I don't know which year that was but David was wearing his hat of controller of BBC Two and um, one reads later getting rather bored with the job because he'd rather put on his shorts and get out to the jungle than sit in board meetings. So you produced the 50s. How many programmes was that? I don't know exactly. I think over three years. There might be more than 50, one would say. But it was using a lot of archive film. So were you sitting watching archive film all day and um, trying to choose clips and, and assembling a programme in that way? Well, it, it came more from the dates rather than the availability of film. And uh, Robert, Will and I worked pretty well together. It was a harmonious time. And what we would do at that time, the British Library, uh, their newspaper archive, uh, was held in Collendale, an obscure North London <laughs> library. And uh, the three of us would go out there and we'd divide up the newspapers for one of the months and um, make notes and then come back and collaborate on what would make a good program. And then, of course, if there was, there was always pathy news or something like that, it could be a little expensive if it was pathy, but um, then we would look at what was available there. But it tended to be date and newspaper-led. Yes, but you could presumably have access to the, the BBC News Archive. Was that really in existence? And the, I mean, in not. It wasn't a, a port of first resort, um, and I think this was because it wasn't catalogued um, in a way that made it accessible. Yes. People didn't realise what rich things they had. No. All that came later, probably. Of it did. Yes, absolutely. And tapes weren't kept, of course, so a lot of material disappeared. Now, did did the fifties survive on tape? Do you know? Or was it uh, given to other programmes who, the, who then used a, a second-class tape rather than the first-class tape? I seem to remember that. You, you paid less if you had a tape that had already been edited. Oh, God, I never had that power to make the decision. But the, um, no, I, I very much doubt that outside of the BFI, probably, where they keep everything, um, there's very much trace of it. No. What happened uh, to you after the French of the 50s? Um... Paul Fox, the controller of BBC One, said he wanted a film programme because there wasn't one at that time, or if there was, it wasn't current. It, it, it was about old films that might be coming up on television. And um, the baton was passed to me to think one up, and really the point was to do a programme that would be the equivalent of, um, at that time, film critics in the newspapers, especially the weekends, were considerable writers, you know, and there's Powell, names like that. And uh, I thought if we could make a programme of that sort of standard, then it would be pleasing. But we had to find the right person. And so we began a fine woman called Jackie Gillett, a novelist who'd worked with me at ITM. But after a season, she said she wanted to go and live in the country, she and her husband and children, so she couldn't get into television uh, centre to, to record the programme. And we tried out one or two other people, but um, it ended up with Barry Norman. There must have been glue on the seat, I think, because he remained in, in his post for about 20 years or more. Yes. Who discovered him? Well, I did. He'd been fired from the Daily Mail and was freelance, and he wrote a funny column in The Times which I used to enjoy twice a week or something. And then I saw him on a discussion on Late Night Lineup, and uh, I thought he was very clubable, as they say, and I thought he might be very good. And um, he had a history of film because uh, his father made, made films at um, Elstree, I think. Oh. What had happened was, a couple of years previously, um, the male newspapers merged and so 50% of their staff went and Barry had been I think show business correspondent of the Daily Mail and so he was fired not for an ineptitude but because there were too many people and so he freelanced but he didn't write um, film columns for the papers just his weekly column on the television. Right but he had a great knowledge of film. Yes he did. Um, he had worked in Fleet Street and done a lot of film reporting. Maybe as an entertainment reporter, really, he would meet people. But he was steeped in it because his father 
Leslie Norman had made films like The Cruel Sea and various others, so he knew the film community. Right, so how did a... a, a you started a film programme. Was it called Film... It was called Film 72. Or, That's when it began. Film 72. Yes. <laughs> and it, it, it then continued for a long time. Yeah. How was a typical Film 72 made? Because you, you were talking about contemporary film. You were talking yes. about this week's films or this month's films, presumably. Yes, it required... It's quite interesting because we would go and see films in preview and they would be sometimes just previewed on the Monday morning, say, for release later in the week. So we wanted to be up to date, but eventually the distributors in Water Street saw that television programmes were making more, more and more use of uh, film clips. And um, apart from charging us a lot for using them, they uh, would put on screenings up to a month before the film's release in the UK. So the idea would be to try and see as many films as were available for release for that particular week, because we tended very much to be on a Monday night, and uh, we had a dispensation to break the embargo if it was for a Thursday or whatever, and go ahead on a Monday, which they, all the film companies, like Warner Brothers or metro Golden mayer uh, or Columbia, um, agreed to let us do. But um, we ran into troubled waters, this is with Jackie indeed, when she started giving films bad reviews. Well, I was wondering about that. What happens if reviews are... After all, it's, it's, it's fairly new, this business of reviewing current films. Well, fairly new, I would say. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, when I watch The One Show nowadays, um, everything that they in any way review is wonderful. You know, it's not a crime, but they, because a lot of their stuff is forthcoming BBC material, the enthusiasm of the presenters for it is, is incredible. But um, I always remember Irma Kurtz, somebody who didn't last very long in the programme, gave a review to One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich and said just what a boring film it was. Then she turned to the chap who was playing Ivan, Sir Tom Courtley, and said, well, how are you? And he just <laughs> virtually spat at her on television. But, you know, no, I had to reach... Of criticism of films is really quite an interesting issue because you have to get permission to show clips yes. from the makers of the films. Um, and they presumably can't demand in advance that you make positive comments about them. No, that's a very good point. And it was up to me as a producer to try and work my way around that. But it came to a head, really, when... Actually, right at the beginning with Jackie Gillett, when she we agreed that we'd give a, a true review by that. I mean, good is good and bad is bad. And she said that. And the uh, distributors or the people who were head of marketing at them didn't like that at all. And so I would have very good lunches in Water Street where we would reach an accommodation so that maybe we would just deal with the flavour of a film that wasn't worth analysing. Would they ask in advance the sorts of things you were likely to say about their films? No, they were commendably restrained. But I think the directors of publicity were used to dealing with film critics who could be quite venomous on occasion and so when we cropped up and we agreed to use film clips supplied by them they knew the rules really which is you don't get a sneak of what's going to be said no and all publicity is good publicity up to a point up to a point yes i think that was in the long run you win um, and seeing your film on the television for two or three minutes there's no better publicity. Mark Commode, of course, is keeping that particular flame alive. Do you think uh, film criticism has changed a lot since your time? That's a good question. It's, te it's changed in the newspapers where I inherited what used to be a rounded essay. So people who were writing about theatre or film or other arts would try and make the column in itself of interest rather than um, just ticking boxes or worst of all giving stars to films, yeah. five stars. I haven't seen the current film programmes so I'm not quite sure what they're like now but um, the, um, 
We kept up to the end. The idea of a broadcast essay, which I've always liked, which Robert Robinson did very well in his field, and um, and Barry Norman too, great great humour sometimes. So the program itself is an entertainment, but um, without getting too serious. Yeah. Now, how many years did those film programmes go on for with Barry before he left and you took over? I think that's right. He was headhunted by Omnibus. Um, and he did two seasons with them. But it didn't really work out because he wasn't comfortable in many of the other arts, you know, especially music and art. And I was one of the few people around who knew how to do it. But I'd, I'd left the film programme as producer by then and I'd gone off to do other things. So I threw my hat in the ring to replace him for two seasons. And, um, so you presented it for two seasons? Yeah, I did. And did the uh, ITN experience uh, that you'd had early in your career make that easier? Yes, it did, because um, the wonders of autocue um, could make you uh, appear tremendously articulate. <laughs> With that one had one running in front of one's life, as it were, so you could be already, always spontaneously witty or correct. But um, there you were, and you were used to it. Um, but the film programmes presumably weren't live, or were they? No, they weren't. Because they were made by the presentation department, the small studios in which, one of which, they, there were two studios in Prez, Pre, inventively named Prez A and Prez B. And I think, yeah, we were in Prez A usually, and uh, we could only get into the programme after lunch and for a couple of hours then. So you just had a couple of hours rehearsal and, and a yes, rehearsal not record very much whatever. time because yeah. people used the studios very much for making trails and in a way they almost took precedence. But we were only on one day a week, so you know harmony arose. Sure, but you presumably rehearsed and then did it in one take, did you? So you didn't have to edit it. Barry was very proud of doing that, as he is on location. If we're making a documentary, he always wants to get things in one take. Um, others were less so, I think. Now, this early work in, in, uh, in television was, was all studio work with, all oh, right, you're making compilations with archive film and things like that. But you weren't going out filming, or were you? No, not a lot. And uh, it was a, a desire to do just that that, well, you, you pestered the head of the department and eventually, it's funny, I um, remember Elliot Kastner, the producer of Where Eagles Dare, telling me how to produce, which is, he went to Alistair MacLean, he found a book on a station bookstore and he went to Alistair MacLean and said, I really think it's very good. I happen to know Richard Burton would like to play the lead in this. And he went to Richard Burton and said, I've optioned where Eagles dare. Would you like to play the lead in it? And I was told that this was the way to produce because you, yes, you, you like pretend you've got sides, everybody. You put yes. it all into yes. one. Yes, you're that, just the last actor we need to make up our, our troupe. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we've got Maggie Smith. <laughs> yes, or whatever. So your first experience with... with going out and directing the film was what? Dustin Hoffman at that time was the hottest actor around because he'd made The Graduate. He had three or four films that had taken him right to the top and he came over to England to do Straw Dogs and I thought this would be a good opportunity to make a profile of him. So I told the BBC that we could get Dustin Hoffman and then told the producers of the Dustin Hoffman film, here's half an hour of exposure for you. And um, so it came to be that we went down to Cornwall. When I say we, it was me and Will Wyatt. We shared some of the directing and, um, oh, just spent a few days on the set of Straw Dogs. I mean, as, as with everything, um, once you turn your cameras off, the really good stuff occurs. And I can remember with Dustin Hoffman, we were all staying in a very posh hotel called the Together Castle Hotel in Cornwall, where there were good-natured good civilian guests. 
But dinner one night, Dustin jumped on his table um, and shouted out, do you want to see an Eskimo pee? And uh, he had loaded his flies with lots of ice cubes, which he then opened and they proceeded to pour out. And this rather astounded the uh, people who were not used to seeing Hollywood actors. Perhaps that's what they always do. <laughs> I wish I could have filmed it. Yeah. Wouldn't that have been Oh, fun? again, the, the cameras weren't turning. No. Always happens, doesn't it? Yeah. So you came back with a with a, a, a documentary on Hoff. Yes, and yeah, I Dustin followed Hoffman. that on. It's quite funny. I independently, a Sunday paper commissioned me to do a profile of Rod Steiger, and he was doing a film called Duck You Suckers in Almeria in the south of Spain, playing a Spanish person. And um, when I got down there, he would only speak in his Spanish accent because he wanted to keep it perfect throughout the sort of six-week shoot of their film. Anyway, I, it introduced me to Al Maria and what you ha still had there were the cowboy locations, uh, whether it's a, a pub or a tavern or a restaurant or whatever High Street has in the Westerns, which had been made... Um, by Sergio Leone's team for the three Clint Eastwood films, starting with The Fistful of Dollars. And so they were still there, these cowboy towns. And um, I thought they'd make a good program because I knew some more films were going to shoot on the same locations the next year and went down with a film crew. And we uh, did a profile of Yul Brynner, who was down there, which was largely an interview between me and him. and. Uh, we managed to get three programmes out of it at about 25 minutes. And um, from then on, I personally began to feel a little bit more comfortable about filming on location. And uh, while never being very good at it, was less intimidated, I think, yeah. than before I first set out. Yeah. So the, the whole business of producing the film programmes and getting to know people made this easier and easier. What were the most difficult ones to deal with? Um, I think the, the smaller names who could be a bit shouty. I remember one programme, I'll try and remember it, though, that Barry hosted, and we had in Jimmy Stewart and Chuck Heston, and they were both in the studio that afternoon with Barry. Great big names. They didn't come any bigger at that time. And uh, intimidating, you would have thought, but in fact, both very tractable and didn't mind the fact that we were in a small studio with paper cups. <laughs> now, you asked me about the difficult ones. Yes. I think I try to erase those from my memory. Yes, there's also <laughs> libel. <laughs> yes, possible. but yeah. there's a thing called, I think, the Rashomon effect, which comes from Akira Kurosawa's film, Rashomon, where four different people witness a pretty brutal act, a man, a rape, a murder. And uh, when they come to give their account of it, they don't seem to be the same thing at all, because there are four different accounts. And so it is with me <laughs> looking back, as you kindly asked me to. I can't remember the dreadful days, really. But this, this I mean, the, making f profiles of actors became your big thing, didn't it? Absolutely. Um, it's a case of one thing leads to another. And um, if you have obtained the agreement of a really good person for a profile or an interview, they inevitably have press agents and word gets around that you're a, a reasonable pair of hands. And I, th I think the breakthrough for me was Clint Eastwood and he agreed to be profiled and to my surprise, he hadn't done much before. And uh, he was part of Warner Brothers' stable, really, to the extent that all his films came out through them. And we made a film called The Man With No Name, which was heavily promoted by the BBC and uh, front cover of the Radio Times and everything, and got way of a good ratings for a documentary, good slot as well. And after that, it became easier to ask stars, whether they're Streisand or whatever, to um, come along and be on for half an hour or however long the slot was. 
How much was the BBC's name important when it came to approaching people like that? Or was it your personal? The BBC was very important. I think um, people had heard of it and it had a, a reputation for reliability. It wasn't going to send you up and it wasn't going to smack you down if you were lending your time, in many cases your house, to me, the producer. It'll be fair play. And so the BBC was very, its reputation for being fair was very strong. Yeah. Now, in those days, were you able to uh, get a book out of an exposure to a, a serious artist like that, like Eastwood? Could you write then a biography? Yes. Eastwood is a good example because it was one of the first books I did about film actors and, or a film actor. And my publisher even sent it to him in proof to be read, um, and he did read it and made only two corrections. In one of them I made a black person white or a white person black, I can't remember what it was. And in the other, a film where I wrote that probably he shared the lead with so-and-so, <laughs> he made the correction. No, I didn't. <laughs> but you got on well with him. Yeah, very well. And what happened was, after I left the BBC, um, he would employ me to... Uh, there's, there's always a documentary of sorts that can be done around a film, a film set. Yes. Actors. And uh, it's very good free publicity if you can get yes. it on television. Yes, making of. The and they're often of. bundled bundled in the uh, DVDs, aren't they, with, uh, with the films themselves. This has now become the case. And I had... Um, well, there were various bits of luck, good and bad, but I had a bit of good luck, which is I had been teaching for a year as a visiting professor at Boston University, and I read in the local newspaper that they were filming Jaws off the coast of Massachusetts. And I'd read the book by Peter Benchley, the now dead son of the famous Robert Benchley of the Algonquin Round Table. And... Um, I thought, now, here's a way to pay my fare back to England. Why don't I shoot something on the set of Jaws? So I found out who the unit publicist was and asked if I could come down, saying we could probably get it out on the BBC. And the guy said on the other end of the phone, never having met me, you may as well come. Nobody else wants to. And indeed, I shot for three days on Martha's Vineyard with Steven Spielberg and whatever actors were in court, <laughs> Richard Dreyfus, And indeed, nobody else went on the set of Jaws with a film camera. So my 10 minutes of film became quite valuable because A, I'd paid for it myself, and um, it's used on any documentary or anything that crops up <laughs> and uh, released with the, uh, initially, the VHS of Jaws. So it was a profitable period, and it did pay for my airfare home. Why do you think nobody wanted to film? Well, it wasn't done in America greatly at that time. And if it was, curiously, a programme that I went on to work for, which was called Entertainment Tonight, which was the first idea that you could make a half-hour programme just about entertainment news. Nothing serious, not the outside world. But they had not begun by then, and they would be the only sort of programme that would go on locations. There was no great appetite for it in America. Extraordinary. In retrospect, yes, because uh, it's rich material, which you see appears again and again. Yeah. Well, even in politics today, remember, they're always referring to the mayor who kept the, the beaches open. He didn't... Oh, in Jaws. lockdown. Yes. <laughs> I'd never heard them using that, but oh, indeed yeah. it was... It made... Things like that made Benchley's book, because the mayor's dilemma, do I close the beaches in a popular... Yeah, it's got East Coast got resonances resort. today. It really has, yeah. Now, tell me about uh, Cleese and, and uh, Frosty. How did you get involved with them? Well, Cleese I can deal with more simply, because he was doing Monty Python, and I was uh, producing some late-night current affairs, which was yawn provoked provoking and we both were working at television center and we both lived in notting hill gate so i think we met on the tube and then tony jay sir anthony jay later to 
right yes minister um knew him and introduced us um and so it was with frost um I didn't meet him on the tube because he went around in a Bentley. But um, Warby Singer, who was then controller of BBC Two, wanted David Frost to do a programme called The Frost Interview. And I was given it. I think I met Frost through television. And they just wanted someone who was um, a good enough producer. I was going to say that the strange thing, you're, you're not as good as your last programme but you're probably as good as your reputation. And if the powers that be, the suits as they're known in Hollywood, think you've got a consistently okay track record, you get work out of that. And so it was that Aubrey took me to lunch with David, David Frost, and um, we got on well enough. And uh, I produced the Frost interview, which went off in bizarre directions because David was at his most uncontrollable. It began with interviews with the three candidates for Prime Minister, who were Wilson, Heath and Thorpe, would you believe, party leaders, I should say. Uh, but then it went into David Land, which uh, is undefined, or <laughs> it would be ill-defined if I defined it. But uh, if you can believe that watching Evil Knievel jump the Snake River Canyon or not, he failed, in fact, in the States is... Uh, the right sort of program to lay side by side with serious frost interviews. Um, well, that's David's doing. I later learned that um, he was being paid also by a television network, not a television network, but a, a sort of home entertainment network that was putting this on cinemas. So they needed a link man. Right. So the frost interviews, um, the, the best of them, I mean, the, the famous one, of course, was with uh, Nixon. Yes, unfortunately, I didn't get that gig. Oh, you didn't. I it thought went you to, did. No, it went to John Burt, who was um, ex-BBC himself. And so they, because the BBC was going to show them, uh, they needed a representative on the shooting. And that, my reputation, did not warrant. <laughs> right. So who were the best Frost reports you did? Certainly with Muhammad Ali. He's, he's wonderful. Ah, oh, now tell us about that. Well, David had had a series, actually for two or three years, on ABC, um, which was David Frost doing a chat show. And so he knew a lot of people. And he himself was very good at producing, getting hold of guests. And he knew that Muhammad trained in Pennsylvania, I think it was called Deer Lake, his training camp was, which was a wonderful place with the names of former heavyweights, including Jack Johnson, carved on boulders all around it and a ranch house and it was just a beautiful place. So we went out there and filmed with Muhammad. And well, that was, you know, one side of David, which was pretty well show busy. And then he just had a nose. I had seen a just a part of a local program um, where there was this woman called Dame Cicely Tyson and she founded I think the first hospice in England for the dying so if people considered you were dying I don't know who has to decide we're all going to die one day but dying soon you could go and live in Dame Cicely's hospice and uh, David thought yeah that would make a good television program. And I remember he and I had lunch on a Sunday and we were a bit nervous. I mean, if you've never been in a hospice, your first time, and it was for both of us, slightly intimidating. And um, we had lunch and then his Bentley took us down to this hospice. And the strange thing is, as we went round it, um, Dame Cicely came on the program a week later, which was done with a studio audience back in the television centre, but we needed to do some homework. But, but the people, the dying, and I think you probably can say that, although I'm not absolutely certain, they would put you at your ease. I'm putting them into a category like um, a, a kindergarten or something, but there was a tremendous... That's what Cicely had created, an incredible atmosphere, and it was they, those who had death sentences, really, 
Who were putting you at your age. Yes, which is a joke. Yes. But one was, even David was quite young then and just not used to it. And how do you begin a conversation with a stranger who has been booked in a place for the terminally ill? Did he have a lot of empathy, do you think, or not? Yes. I mean, by the time I came to work with him, he was extraordinarily famous. In fact, the Observer did a poll not so long before finding out that he was the best-known person in Britain because he was on television a lot and uh, he wasn't short in, in putting himself forward, really. Were you still employed as a BBC person then or had you gone freelance, as it were? I was never so completely employed that they would put me on staff. In fact, it's quite amusing. Uh, I was on long contracts, ah. but not staff. This is really your purpose, because it's about staff. No, we... Uh, we're, about, we're about anyone who worked for the BBC in any way. Uh, <laughs> yes. And that, that includes you. <laughs> yes. Do you know, these things happen in succession. I left Boston University, although they did ask me to stay on, which uh, was flattering. Went through Jaws did that filming, went curiously to the Cannes Film Festival. So I flew to Boston, from Boston to, well, Nice, and um, helped film whatever it was then to make their programmes. Came back to London and was summoned back to um, Current Affairs. Now, I had ended up running the BBC's Watergate coverage for the simple reason that I had previously been assisting on it in London. And then the producer, Dick Francis, had booked a yacht in the Caribbean for him and a lady he would later marry and one or two of the members of the Washington branch of the Watergate coverage. And so it ended, they, they shot off to get their suntans. And um, unfortunately, Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Dean uh, didn't have the luxury of a summer holiday and had to remain <laughs> in the caucus building giving evidence to 11 senators and so I went to Washington and by and large took charge of our coverage of it, which was nightly at the time. And so coming back to your question, I was uh, called into the BBC and, and the Chris Story, who was then called by, they, it's now called Human Resources or something, but they called them what? Well, personnel. In personnel officer, yes. Um, it was up to him to do the talking and he asked me to see me, me to see him rather, and he said, you know, we'd like to give you a contract for 30 years, because I was 30 then, and that would take me up to obligatory retirement age of 60. And I said, wait a minute, why a contract? Why not just put me on the staff? And he said, to be candid, Ian, we think you're good at your job, but that's what you do. If you could see it like being a dentist, that's your profession, but we're not sure that you would advance in the BBC through the ranks. And the BBC is very hierarchical, and I think my next one up would be editor in charge of some producers or whatever. So he pretty well blanked that and said, I don't think it was his own initiative. I think one or two others had thought about it. We'd like you, because you did a responsible job on Watergate or whatever, to come back and be a producer, what was then known as an MP6 producer, which was the highest grade. Um, but just on contract, not... Um... That's interesting. That had con consequences for pensions and so on. It's a very good point, yes. No, you, you got 15% more than somebody on the staff of the same grade would get. But that was meant to go into your own personal pension fund um, because the BBC wasn't um, feeding it. That's really interesting. They've worked it out, haven't they? Yeah. And statistically, it's interesting, 15%. Quite high, really. Did you actually do that? Or did you think, as I did at that age, <laughs> more money, whippy? No, I actually thought, having been freelance for a little bit by then, that it's a risky way of life. And um, I did begin to pay into a personal scheme. What's quite interesting is uh, that um, a year or two ago, some of the big names in the BBC were accused of the, by the press of having 
set up companies to be get their salaries paid into and therefore avoiding quite a lot of tax. But at the time that I was obliged to look after my own pensions, it wasn't possible to have a personal pension. And what you had to do was, I was advised by my accountant, set up a limited company and that would employ you. And so Kensington Television came about. <laughs> um, and that was, for two or three years there, that was the only way that you could have a l legitimate pension. Very strange, that. Very strange, yeah. What, uh, looking back, do you think was the most exciting um, programme you made? Well, I have to say that I did a programme with Muhammad Ali where we went back to Deer Lake and then I went with him back to visit his parents, Cassius Clay, I'm trying to think where he came from, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And we filmed with him there, and the mayor gave him a bit of reception. I met his brother, who was a bit tongue-tied compared to Cass. And then we went to Harvard, where he gave the commencement address, which was very sparky. And he had a little homily to tell them how uh, he liked all races and religions. He just didn't distinguish. And when it came to question time, a student put up his hand and said, would you give us a demonstration of the rope dope And he said that in American. I don't even know what the rope dope is. What is it? Um, it's a thing that Ali invented for prolonged exchanges of blows in the ring where he would go backwards and forwards against the rope. So it would help him in many ways, one in avoiding blows and the other is adding strength to when he delivered them. He bounce off the the ropes and, off. and then then strike. The dope was the other chap <laughs> to the receiving end. And Ali looked at the audience and said, this guy, he hasn't even paid a dollar to get in here and he wants me to do the rope of dope. God, I mean, he must be Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> but uh, he... I mean, you've said it's, it's your most memorable. Presumably he was a, a very different person to what you saw in the ring. What was he like as a person? Really articulate. There was no doubt about it. And he was, they say of people that he filled the room. But if you were spending some time with Muhammad Ali, and I did for three weeks, when you went anywhere, you knew he was there because quite tall and with a sort of a magnetic personality, no doubt about it. And he, he loved all that. But later, of course, he, he got dementia, didn't he? Yes, a tragic end. And uh, uh, what a fine mind was overthrown, because those poems, he would make them up, no doubt about it, very spontaneous. But possibly too many punches that uh, he didn't avoid. Yes. Now, you seem to have kept away from politics, really, in your career. Is that, is that the case? You've made a few programmes on political things, you, I think you implied earlier. Well, the period when I worked at, in Lime Grove was not a happy period. It was, for me, it was late nights for a programme that probably didn't go on until after 10.30. And very often it would have a little arts item in it because, um, well, to make it rounded. But when it came to the night, the uh, editor of the day would want to deal with whatever was hot and therefore a well-rounded little film got dropped. Got dropped, <laughs> That yes. happened yes. quite a lot. But um, I had my fingers burnt slightly when, uh, through David Frost, I knew Harold Wilson, who retired young as prime minister. I was asked to devise a late night show for BBC Two, which I called Friday night, Saturday morning, because it would span over midnight. And Ned Sharon, who was a hero of mine, a very good producer, hosted the first two, um, which went well enough. And then I got, had got asked Harold Wilson, amazingly, um, would he do the next two? And I said to him, you know, since you chaired the cabinet every few days you know doing a chat show shouldn't be too hard and he agreed which was something of a coup did by reputation a lot of good <laughs> until we actually made a program <laughs> and how the, the concept of friday night saturday morning was the guest host would ask people to come on they'd be friends or people he'd always wanted to talk to or she always wanted to talk to 
Anyway, Harold had a bold selection of people. Um, he did two programmes, and uh, in the first one, Harry Seacombe he'd wanted to have. And Harry, well, he judged what was going wrong. Namely, in a normal conversation, people paused to think. But you're not allowed to do that on television. You're not allowed to think on television. You have to keep talking whilst you're thinking. And Harry noticed that Wilson, and this was going live on tape, would... Um, pause as he might take a suck of his pipe, uh, which you could smoke then on television, and uh, there would be silence, which Harry Seacombe filled by beginning to whistle. <laughs> um, so, my embarrassment, we managed to edit a bit of the programme, but it wasn't good, and uh, Harold and I were united in uh, bad press, I think. He was just in there for two two episodes. Yes, people, it, it was shared out like that, uh, the, the idea. So it wasn't that there was a run of 20 that you'd booked him for and you had to kick <laughs> him out. <laughs> no, it was just as well. Yeah. Um, no, two was about right, because if the presenter is inviting friends or people they'd like to meet, two it was pretty well enough, you know, in terms of programmes. But Ned Sheeran went on, or did he just do a couple? He uh, did a couple. He, he kicked it off and was very helpful, very inspirational. But then, really, when you ask about memorable programmes, one of the most memorable Friday night, Saturday mornings was one that Tim Rice did, but which I set up with John Cleese. And John Cleese and Michael Palin had just made Monty Python's Life of Brian, which was a controversial film. So we agreed it would make a good show. So here's this film that some people will be upset about yes. because they think it's mocking Christ and the idea was that they would debate Malcolm Muggeridge who you, uh, you had to try and stop him appearing on television as opposed to inviting him to appear on television he, he loved it and the Bishop of who used to Mervyn Stockwood stop, God. so Malcolm Muggeridge and Mervyn Stockwood whom I knew because he used to he liked young people to come to dinner and I had a girlfriend for a while who uh, would take me along. So I said, would you like to come and do this program? And um, he made it because uh, he came in full, full gear, rang me up, said, should I wear my bishop's outfit? I said, please do. And as he scolded John and Michael, he had a silver cross, a bishop's cross round his neck, which he held out in an evangelical way to, to tell them what they'd done had been he should have brought garlic, garlic with him. He should indeed. So they were the blasphemers. Yes. But Cleese and Palin emerged quite well from that because they were slightly more logical. Did you have much to do with the Pythons? Well, it, I went out. I used to go on summer holiday with John two or three times. And then he said, well, this summer I can't go because um, we're going to Tunisia to film Life of Brian. And he said, why don't you come out and make one of your films? And I found that we could transmit it ten years after Python had first gone out. So we filmed in Tunisia on the set of Life of Brian. Well, I, I seem to remember that programme. They, they, they roped in all sorts of people to appear. I mean, Spike Milligan happened to be around. Yes, he happened to be travelling through part. Tunisia, except that he got a small part which they filmed before lunch and then he was meant to do his close-up after lunch, only he um, disappeared. I met up with him about later in the year. Well, by chance, he was in the BBC bar, and he was just sitting on his own, and I hadn't really got any clearance from him because I left him in our documentary. And he said, no, it's fine, you can use whatever you shot. And he said, I'm here waiting for Johnny Spate, who was the writer of Till Death to Us Part, because he's got a surprise for me. The surprise is he hasn't turned up. Because <laughs> <laughs> those, um, those Milligan programmes, Q, the Q programmes, were extraordinarily anarchic, weren't they? They were going on at the time you were there. Yep, they were. I didn't, unfortunately, working on late night current affairs, you missed a lot of earlier in the evening television. So I didn't see enough of them. Yeah. Are there any more things about your career at the BBC that you'd like to talk about? Well, one thing used to lead to another, and actually it was the Jaws programme mm. went on to be actually bought by whatever the film programme was of that year. 
actually established a, a contact with Steven Spielberg, and that was valuable because I worked for him. Never doing making of, someone else did that, but we would make ancillary films like Stephen and Stanley about his relationship with Kubrick, and I, did, I think I did eight of those. And so they were paid at American rates, which is slightly higher than the BBC, which was very welcome, and uh, Spielberg was a good contact. Were these films made to be shown on the BBC? Sometimes, but they were up for grabs. Um, they were financed by, I think, Universal, usually, and then they would give them away in some countries. Mm -hmm. As promotional films. Promotional material, yeah. You yeah. Know. So the BBC would show them, would it? Yep, they, they'd be happy to. But when you ask anything memorable, what I liked, I'm not sure I did like it, but because it begins in an unhappy way, uh, but... The, the, BBC, it seemed to me, had, in radio, where I worked for a bit, a sort of Hungarian flavour to it. There were lots of Hungarians, it seemed, in the radio and the world service. And um, Conrad Sirop was the one who chaired my general trainee panel and started drawing a large cartoon as I rambled on. I knew I wasn't winning. But later on, when I came back after my spell in Washington and Boston. I again was freelance and wanted to get into some radio. There was a weekly, a nightly program called La Kaleidoscope, and the head of that department was George Fisher, also Hungarian, Georg probably Fisher, and he said to me, "Right, well," and I'd done some pieces for Kaleidoscope when I was living in the States, and they'd gone out. And he said, "But I wanted to be a presenter," and it. It was available, um, there was a slot. And he said, it's very important that you speak perfect English and articulate in an intelligent way. And I said, I'm, I'm sure I can do that. Thank you very much. And so he said, as I was leaving, we will with you a contract make. <laughs> <laughs> so radio um, was part of your, your career as well. Do you, yeah, like, no. do you like radio? I mean, it, it, it strikes me as a much more flexible medium in many ways for ideas. I agree. I mean, now in retirement, at six o'clock, I very often go to the bedroom and listen to the radio news than watch the television news because a lot of television news, especially today, follows the pictures. So, you know, if there's a volcano in the Canary Islands, that's worth two minutes of really good volcano. Whereas the radio news doesn't have that luxury and it has more depth. Good idea to uh, praise the radio because I think it's radio is in, in many ways at its best, whereas television, I, I don't know where it's going. It's, it's very good. For instance, as we speak today, it's a science day and Al Khalidi is presenting a science program and everything's going to talk about science and you learn so much more. I had a daughter, um, she's still alive, <laughs> who went to Edinburgh University, and on the drive up to Edinburgh, well, she would listen to pop music or something, but on the drive back, I would listen to Radio 4 all the way, and you could be so informed by a day's listening to Radio 4, and so it is today. What do you think about the grammar of television these days? Uh, I mean, I'm told that the average time between cuts is four seconds now. Pans never settle, zooms never settle, people are cutting away all the time. Does that worry you? I mean, do you think the, 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 it's got fr more frenetic? Yes, it does worry me. When Americans used to look at my documentaries, they'd be shocked at the fact that they were so leisurely. But it starts with the fact of economy. And now very often a programme is made and filmed and produced and everything by just one, one man and his camera. When I went with Robert Robinson to make two long programmes about the British in India, our crew was 11. <laughs> we even had a little bus that we went around in. So now the difference between 11 people and one man is considerable. It's 10 people. <laughs> it's, <quite laughs> it's 10 people. <laughs> And also another 300,000 people who happen, Indians, who happen to turn up wherever you're shooting. It's making it virtually impossible. Um, but yes, the cutting is, it's come from America and it is much more rapid now. It's I mean, you would I, like to think that films depended mainly on writing and acting. Yes. 
and a lot of other things get in the way. <laughs> what, like car chases? Yes, like car chases. And, uh, yeah. But I have a theory that um, documentaries can be either 25 minutes or 40 minutes. In fact, there used to be a series called 40 Minutes, because yeah. a 25-minute documentary really can only say one thing. But maybe at 40 minutes, you can say three things. Anyway, this is a piece of my own imagination. But there's a program that runs that I enjoy on BBC television called Who Do You Think You Are? And I can just, whenever I watch it, it runs an hour, I can see the 40-minute documentary that's straining to get out. But the rest of it is filled up with car journeys, people going to and fro wherever their ancient relatives used to be. Apparently unnecessary, but it's just to pad it out. Uh, I wonder if we're just old farts now, and we just, uh, we, we just uh, don't like it the way it's done now because it's not done the way it used to be done in our day. I, I mean, I do get very worried about uh, visual jarring where the directing says, look at me, look at me. Yes. I agree. I, I think television, unfortunately, sort of comes out of Blue Peter now. Every, every, everything sort of is a Blue Peterish approach, um, which is is not as, as good as Radio 4. It's a bit of an insult to Blue Peter myself. <laughs> well, I'm saying it's the mindset of a very young person who needs everything explained. <laughs> yes, quite. Oh, dear. Well, I think we've uh, we've probably covered most of it, haven't we? We have, yes. So thank you very much, Ian. I enjoyed that enormously. Well, it's a great pleasure, David, to be part of this series. And as David Frost used to say, the BBC is alma mater to us all. Very good. <laughs>